About 10 years ago, I was sitting in my court and I had a very sensitive case involving a 14-year-old who had been suicidal and I had placed her in a psychiatric hospital. The social worker came to court and I read the report and she recommended that the child go home with what she called wraparound services. I'd never heard of them before. I was shocked. I thought this was a dangerous recommendation. I knew the social worker well. I looked her in the eye and I said, what is this all about? And I examined her for a half an hour on what was happening with this young girl who I thought could only survive in a psychiatric hospital. And she explained to me what wraparound services were and how the family, the community, the professionals had gotten together and planned for this youngster's life in the community so that she would be safely watched at all times. I asked if this had been tried before and she said that she'd been doing these cases for a while and, and this was not the most serious. So I went along with it. I made the orders and I watched the case very carefully. And it was a miracle as far as I was concerned that not only was the youngster successful in the community, but I was able to dismiss the case in less than a year. Uh, let's start with what's working. What are some things that are really going good this week since our last meeting? Michael has been much less argumentative than he was a couple weeks ago. Cool. And I'm very proud of him for that, and, and we get along much better. Don't we, Michael? You know, I probably can't really explain it as well as I probably will, but um, just changing my attitude, realizing what how that how, what what um realizing what was happening by me doing it and realizing that's not what I what I wanted so I just changed and everything we've been in a better mood. All right, so let's see. Let's talk about what's working. What's happening? What is going okay? What's working for us? Well, her meds are working since we put her back on. Oh, okay. For you, Ginger, since being back on the meds, what's working for you? Basically working. <laughs> what what change? What 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 are the most noticeable changes that you feel inside, or thing that you say? <laughs> I'm more calm. Calmer. Calmer. Okay. Calmer. <clears throat> so let's talk about um, what's working. The good stuff. What's been going on with you guys? Um, I don't know. I guess. Um, I've been going to school. I've been taking the baby to school with me. There's a Tell us about that. There's a program at wow. my school where I can take her with me, and um, they'll take care of her during school. And then after. School, what we decided to do is look all around the country, and in fact, around the world, to see who's getting the best outcomes with the really, the kids with the most difficult problems in their families, and, and how were they doing it? And we looked uh, all around the United States, and we looked in, uh, actually, it's, uh, in New Zealand at some programs, and we looked. Uh, in Great Britain, so we looked in several countries. Uh, the, a number of programs, you know, stood out, but the one that really stood out for the really high-end kids was the approach called Wraparound. And the whole approach was instead of bringing ten very troubled kids together to live together in one group situation and trying to design one program for those ten kids, you go out to the family and the child and you build a plan for that particular child and that particular family that's built on their strength, that, that's family-centered, that identifies their needs and meets their needs. The child for whom wraparound is, is best designed is a child facing multiple adversities. These children come from um, difficult environments, including their neighborhood, uh, high-risk uh, families, uh, high-risk um, communities in general, oftentimes uh, poorly um, organized schools. And then on top of that, they have uh, severe uh, mental illness. And so in, in the context of, of the child uh, who's facing multiple adversities such as these, we find that a multifaceted uh, ecological approach is just much more effective. Many times when I've gone to hear their story and I've asked them, please tell me about your child's strengths, they'll cry 
I'll be the first person that they, they have heard that from in the system. The first clinician that has wanted to know and has gotten more invested in hearing about their child's strengths and goals and dreams. And then when they get to experience us investing in these creative strategies to meet those needs, suddenly that gains so much more importance than what initially was driving them to seek help. So they put him in this group home and he was um, like 10 or 11 and the youngest next to him was 14. Those kids all had jobs they, and they treated him differently than he'd ever been treated. And he started throwing things and talking back and broke their screen door and everything. At 11 o'clock one night, they called me and said, we've had to send him down to juvenile hall. That's been his only time in juvenile hall, but they said there's no way he wanted to live there. Program Uplift came into our life and they backed him up at school so he could stay in school. They sent a worker or a specialist, they call him program specialist, over to the school for recess so they wouldn't get in any fights. The first thing I ever really knew about wraparound, I heard from a woman at a symposium who was in our system and she said her child had been in our system for several years and we kept telling her we'd do this for the child or we'd do that and she said sometimes it would happen and other times it wouldn't and then somebody came to her and said we have a new program it's called wraparound we would like to see if you're interested and very skeptically she went into it and she said she couldn't believe it they asked her what she needed she told them she needed somebody to come to the house and help her get the kid out of bed in the morning and she thought they would laugh at her. The first day they were there to help the, her kid get out of bed and they continued to do that. They would go every single morning, help the child get out of bed, teach her methods to do the same thing and then they would get the child to school and for a while sat at school with him every day all day and they just felt like, you know, it's we're important. Um, my son had gone into the system when he was seven and a half. And when Wraparound became available uh, to me as a pilot, he was 13 and a half, and they were wanting to transition him home. But he was also considered to be um, a violent person at times, and at 13 and a half, he was already six feet tall and weighed 160 pounds, and um, quickly became much bigger than that uh, after he got home. And I only lived in a two-bedroom apartment, and he most certainly needed his own room. And I didn't have the financial uh, resources to be able to sustain him at home with us. So Wraparound uh, assisted me in helping him to transition home from placement mentality, which we call institutionalization. He had to learn how to act socially responsible in community. Um, there were a lot of things that my son had to learn that he did not learn while being in placement all of those years. And the other thing, it was interesting because when he went to school, he was more attracted to the kids that he had been accustomed to being with in placement. Uh, he didn't know how to pick healthy friends. And we had to show him that uh, through the use of uh, what we now call uh, a shadow. And that was very important and key uh, intervention in our family's plan because that person actually shadowed my son in class walked with him when he came home, you know, brought him, or got him up in the morning, brought him home, did his homework, and then when there was conflict, how to resolve it. About 14 months, we went to court, and uh, the court dropped its jurisdiction over my son after having been in the system for nine years. So a wraparound team is composed of uh, what we call natural team members and professional members. And the goal is always to have um, over half of the team being natural team members. That would be the little league coach, the aunt, the uncle, um, grandma who cares for Bobby after school. Um, I actually saw one woman who made the original child protective service call, a neighbor down the street who actually came on the team because the mother realized that that was one of the people in the neighborhood that really cared about her son. Then you have the professional members which would be the facilitator who's facilitating the process, 
Oftentimes, the referring worker from the system, which would be a social worker, um, a mental health worker, or a juvenile probation officer, um, could be the teacher as needed, could be the psychiatrist as needed, could be um, a separate therapist as needed, whoever the professionals are, as well as the natural team members. And what we found is the teams that have the best outcomes and do the best of maintaining kids in the community across time are the ones with the highest natural team membership. Diane, Kirk, Mary, mainly. What did they do? They've helped me. Change my attitude. Maybe a, maybe a mate made me a more likable person. Yeah, it helps. Well, it helps having a program like this, like Uplift, because you, they like help you on emotional stuff and behavioral stuff. And what, how, what choices would you have? I'd be in trouble without this group. <laughs> Yeah, it really helped me a lot. But I know I can rely on her because when I page her, she'll call me, even on the weekends, you know, um, she'll, she'll, when I page her, you know, I press 911 and she'll call me right back. And, and that helps me out a lot because if I don't have anyone to release all that out to, it just stays inside and I react on it in a bad way. I've talked to these uh, service providers for the RAP programs who will literally follow kids um, one, two o'clock in the morning just trying to encourage them to come back to their placement. Talk about it. Let's keep you safe. What can we do? I mean, they're just, it is the people that make the program. It is a, a, a wonderful dedication. So to be in the meeting and hear Eric take responsibility and make a plan for controlling himself and then for mom to put the limits on this is what will happen if you, if you come near me, um, that we, we did feel really good walking out like we had a safety plan. Throughout the meeting he was just saying, you know, I don't want to talk about this anymore, I'm going to leave. But he stayed through, it was a little over an hour meeting, he stayed through the entire meeting and was able to just kind of say, he'll work on it and accepting our support. So, Think about taking a kid with a major psychiatric disorder who's hallucinating or delusional, paranoid, can't tell reality from his disordered thinking. Imagine putting that human child into a cage. Imagine what it feels like to be losing your mind and be incarcerated. Yet we take these same children and we put them in cages and we leave them there. Oftentimes undiagnosed, oftentimes, more often than not, untreated. And we do precisely the opposite of what that child needs and what would be the minimum that we should have expected of ourselves in terms of just basic humanity. Um, according to the Constitution, all of us as adults, anyway, have a right to be free from cruel and unusual punishment. To in incarcerate a child who's uh, psychotic, it's cruel and unusual, there's just no other way to see it that I could think of. And um, at this point, I'm going to turn the mic over to Stephen Hughes, the facilitator for the family. Here you go. You know how we always talk? We never give up on a family. I'm going to give you a family that never gave up on themselves. This family started the program Uplift in 1997. I'd like to introduce the Mike family. People say, are you going to miss Uplift because you're going to graduate? And I said, well, I will, but I feel like they're still there if I really needed them. But secondly, we have these other people that are supportive in our life. Again, and everything has just been so, so helpful because I'm alone and Michael is my purpose in life, my reason to get up every morning.
I'm convinced after these 10 years that wraparound services are the most important development in service delivery that I have seen since I've been a judge. I've been a judge for 23 years. This is a remarkable phenomenon. We have everyone from our court system persuaded that wraparound services work because they've all seen it. They've, the attorneys for the children are delighted because they know their kids are safe. The attorneys for the parents are delighted because they know they can get the supports that they need for their uh, challenging kids. And the results have been satisfactory across the spectrum of our participants in the dependency system. But fundamentally, the reason that people ought to do it is because it gets much better outcomes for kids and families. And in the long term, it's less expensive. And then hopefully we can take some of those savings and reinvest them at the front end to keep some of the kids from coming into the system in the first place.